All right, open your Bibles this evening to 1 John for a few minutes and want to look at one of the challenges in the Christian life that we face. 1 John chapter 5, beginning in the first verse says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? Uh, There's a statement in verse number 4 that expresses the greatest strength that a Christian has in the existence that we have between the moment we trust Christ and the moment we are ushered from this life through death or at his coming the greatest asset that we possess, the greatest strength that we possess is our faith. Verse number four, the end of the verse says, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Now that's a pretty bold statement, that something could be stronger than the world. Something could be more powerful than the world and that a human being might be in possession of that power. We think about the fear uh, of nations today. We live in crazy, I don't think that's a good word, crazy can be funny. We live in insane times. Insanity rules the day. I remember Brother Roloff back in the 70s making the statement that we're living in an insane asylum run by the inmates. And I remember Christians would chuckle about that. It's not funny anymore because it is a perhaps self-fulfilling prophecy because we see it on every hand. We profess that we're getting better, but for every step we take in the assumed place of getting better, we find more fear, more panic, more whatever you might want to add to that list. We are supposedly safer than we've ever been in our lives, and yet we put up bars on the doors and burglar alarms in the homes, and we sleep at night with one eye open and a loaded weapon next to the bed. Something's not right. Something's wrong. We are somehow perplexed in the life that we live. And in contrast to that, in John here is given the life of the believer, the strength that a believer possesses. We are finding ourselves more and more looked down on this world. It's good to know that we're the cause of all the problems. I mean, I finally figured it out. It's our fault. Uh, and, uh, you know, you just listen to a few political campaign messages, and, and that's what you'll eventually find out. It's all Christians' fault that our founding fathers actually came here to escape Christianity. And uh, they came here under the guise of being Christians, and yet they came here to escape Christianity and to blot out any tenet of Christianity there might be, that it might not affect their children and their offspring as long as they live. They wanted to form a country that was completely divorced from the idea that there was a God, and they wanted to bathe their descendants in the knowledge that there was no real true God, that every man was free to do whatever he wanted to do, however his conscience led him. That was the principles of our founding fathers. The problem with that is that's not stated in one remaining of 20 million original documents. Uh, But yet that's what we're led to believe. And uh, I'll be honest with you, from time to time I feel myself, but I run into Christians who really are under the burden, the heaviness of the day in which we live. We've talked about it several times in the last few months and the idea of, well, why try and, and what's the use and uh, you know, we can't win, and uh, they're, they're going to come. I honestly believe in the next decade you may see Christians incarcerated for believing in Jesus Christ. I believe that with all of my heart. 
You say, that's foolish. Hang around 10 years and wait and see. Uh, we are quickly moving that way. There have been discussion already in the Department of Justice within the last three months about what the meaning of liberty for Christians means. And uh, somehow it does not mean that you have the right to disagree with anybody else. <laughs> Why have a religion? Hello? You say, well, we need all kinds of... Why? Why? We can't disagree. I think every form of religion is wrong, save the one I practice. You say, that's arrogant. Well, I understand they believe the same thing. Why does it bother you? It doesn't bother me. Why is it that some folks get so ticked off they want to take a gun or a bomb and blow somebody up? That just shows the infancy of what they really believe or the fallacy of what they really believe. The very idea, if you show a movie and it offends me, I'm going to start shooting and killing people. You know, if you didn't, and I've said it before, if you didn't know any other way that Christianity was the real deal, you'd know it that way. We don't have that option. Sometimes I wish I did. You know what he said? He said, love your enemies. Boy, that kind of messes things up, doesn't it? When you got your vest strapped on and, you know, the trigger's working well and and I'm going to take care of my enemies. He said, eh, 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 eh. if you got what I want you to have, you love your enemies and you pray for those that despitefully use you. And you say, well, what is that proof? That proves this. That proves that what I have keeps me in restraint to what my normal tendencies would be. You don't want me to live in a world where you're free to do whatever you want to do. Trust me. Maybe you're a wimp. Maybe you're a weenie. You can't trust me in a world where I can do whatever I want to do. You say, you're the preacher. I know, but I'm honest. The rest of you aren't, so I'm just helping you out with that. Can you imagine how many banks would be robbed tomorrow if people just did what they wanted to do? Hello? Uh, anyway, he says here, the strength that we have. He said, this is the victory that overcometh the world, the world stands in opposition to the tenets and the principles of Christianity, it always has. And the world has a pressure that it puts upon Christians, always has. And it's not unusual to think that Christians might be incarcerated. You go back less than two or three hundred years in our history and they were burned at the stake by the thousands. Very often in history books I've read the story of the Salem witch trials. Have you read the Salem witch trials? Horrible things. And the Salem witch trials, terrible things. And, and anybody know how many witches actually died in the Salem witch trials? Oh, there wasn't even 20. 13. Wow, he said, well, one is bad enough. You know, at the same time that in Europe, over 300,000 Christians were being killed on a, every three-year basis, 100,000 a year was the average, and nobody said a word about it over there. And by the way, you know how the Salem witch trials stopped? You know who ended the Salem witch trials? Christians. Let me give you a name you can remember. Sewall. My name is spelled S-O-W-E-L-L -L, and it was S-E-W-A-L-L -L, who was a judge who was a believer in Jesus Christ that called those contests into question because they violated the sense of Scripture and said this is not right, this is not holy, this is not what God... And he was responsible for ending the mess. Christians ended the Salem witch trials, not the secular world. The secular world ruled in Europe. And the deaths continued long past the Salem witch trials. The world's never appreciated Christianity. Uh, you want to know how much the world loves Jesus Christ? I'm, I can help you with that. I really can. I hear people all the time say, well, you know, everybody loves Jesus. Let me help you. Let me help you. I can show you in five minutes what the world thinks about Jesus Christ. Conclusively. You really want to know? Will you accept my challenge? When you leave tonight, pick up 35 gospel tracks back there out of that gospel track rack. And tomorrow afternoon about lunchtime, go stand on the campus of Toledo University. Or go downtown and stand in the middle of town as the businessmen come out of their offices and go to lunch. And with a friendly smile on your face, dress nicely. Don't be offensive. Don't say anything offensive. As they walk by, say, could I give you something about Jesus Christ? And just listen as you pass out those tracks. And come back and tell me what the world thinks of Jesus Christ. There has always been that opposition. 
But the scripture here indicates that we have something that overcomes the world. It maintains strength for us. And that strength is our faith. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Faith is ridiculed in this day and time. Ridiculed as though, well, somehow, you know, it's, it's like believing fairy tales. It's like listening to, you know, uh, the fairy tales that you heard as a child and actually believing in that stuff. And how can you be so superstitious? How can you believe, you know, listen, faith is the strongest element there is on the face of the earth. I mentioned before the irony of that is I, I, can't, I haven't counted and I probably should. I know on at least five to seven occasions I have been in the room with someone who was dying who asked me to come with, their, with my Bible and they were professing atheists. You godless coward. You know what we find out? We find it's easy to live without him. It's pretty hard to die without him. It's easy to live without faith. It's pretty hard to die without faith. And uh, when, you know, when you're right up against it, it's, you know, pastor, you know, could you, I, I just want to hear a little more. <laughs> what they're saying is I've got to this point in my life and what I have isn't good enough. What I have isn't strong enough. And I need something that's stronger. He said this is the victory. Our faith. Our faith. I want to talk to you tonight about that faith. Faith is a, would require days and weeks of study, and we've been involved in some in the last couple of years here about our faith. James says in the first chapter of his book that the trying of our faith worketh patience. So I understand from that that the faith that I have can be tried, it can be tested, it can be stretched as it were. I understand from the book of 1 Peter that my faith is a foundation upon which other things can be built. He said, and besides this, add to your faith. And then he gives us a list of valuable assets in a Christian's life that should be built upon that foundation of our faith. I also understand in the scriptures that there are those who are weak in faith. And then I understand conversely there are those who are strong. In the faith. Now, you and I might make an assumption that when we talk about someone who's weak in the faith, we are talking about someone who has only been saved a very short time. It just stands to reason that those who are weak in the faith, what he's referring to there are those baby Christians. And those who are strong in the faith, well, of course, that, that would be those of us who have been saved as long as I have. The truth of the matter is nothing is further from the truth in the scripture. Very often those that you would have assumed should have been strong in the faith were those who were weak in the faith. As we studied Hebrews several weeks ago, we came through that passage. He said, when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again the first principles. He said, you haven't even got the first principles. And yet people would look at you and expect that you would be teachers. And those that we would have assumed would have been those strong in the faith were yet childish in their faith. May I say this too, faith can weaken and faith can strengthen. Meaning what? Meaning you may be very strong in the faith today, but you don't know what tomorrow holds. If you've lived very long as a Christian, you know that there are circumstances, and sometimes those circumstances come to bear when we are tempted to question our faith. When the pressures mount and when we tend to back away, and I've had people tell me, you know, preacher, I, I used to, it used to be so clear, but now it's cloud. You say, what's happened there? Strong faith has become weak faith. Having said that, if faith is the victory that overcomes the world, then I need to recognize how important my faith is, and I need to understand that my faith needs to increase. My faith needs to deepen. As time goes along, there is saving faith. And that's not what I'm talking about tonight particularly, but it is that basis of faith. The Bible says that God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. 
You know, when you came into this world, you learned to live by faith. People who scoff at people who live by faith are, you know, it, it's just kind of funny. It's kind of humorous. People say, well, you know, I just don't believe in living stuff by faith. You know, I'm, I'm more of an intellectual myself. Well, you fooled me. You probably ought to talk like one. You know, every one of those professors tomorrow are going to drive down the road to get to their place where they profess. I learned many times in conversation with professors, they don't always possess what they profess. But they're going to head and make their pathway. You know, every time they come to a green light, they're going to go through it. Now, you want to stand and give me scientific proof that the guy's going to stop going the other way? I'm sorry, you don't have it. It doesn't exist. It never has existed. Can I tell you why you go through a green light? Faith. We could go on and spend hours of time and you'd be amazed at how many professors live the majority of their life by faith. And they just deny faith in the area of their relationship with God. That doesn't make you intelligent. That makes you a hypocrite. Particularly when you turn around and scoff at people who profess to live by faith. We all live by faith. We come into this world, we have to live by faith. You can't possibly know everything there is to know at any one given moment about anything. And so what remains is simple faith. What we need to understand is that we don't have an overwhelming amount of it. But he's dealt to us the measure I don't know what size the measure is, but I know this, it is enough to bring you certainty as concerning the effectiveness of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. You say, well, you know, the Bible says if you had faith, you'd move mountains. Faith is a grain of mustard seed, you'd move mountains. What does that mean? It means I don't have it. It means I don't have that much. I wish I did. I, I would like to get to that place. I have several mountains I'd like to pick up and drop in certain places. I, I, don't, I don't have that much faith. But whatever it is, I assume it's probably a very minuscule amount, but he has dealt to every man the measure of faith. When you came into the world, you were given enough faith to get to heaven. You may not have faith to move mountains, but you've got enough faith to go to heaven when you die. Uh, you may not have enough faith to stop the rivers and walk across on dry land, but you have enough faith to get to heaven. Uh, you may not have enough faith to, to stop the sun in its course, and uh, you may not have enough faith to deal with some of those matters, but you have enough faith to get to heaven. God gave it to you and told you that he did, and now when you miss that, or if you miss that, it's not God's fault. Sometimes we don't understand what the term faith is all about. Faith is not just blind trust. Okay? Uh, faith is, is not a, a positive mindset, you know, if you just believe it, if you just believe it, if you just believe it. Brother Johnson's a friend of ours. He's a professional golfer, and he's played golf with a lot of these guys, and he was telling me one time about being with one of the golfers who was really struggling in his game, and he'd hired a professional to help him, and the professional had instructed him that for some reason he had to think like a coyote. And he actually paid this guy to travel with him on the golf tour to remind him that he was the coyote. And our friend was asked to leave the golf course, even though he'd played golf with this guy a number of times, was a good friend with him, but he was asked to leave because every time this guy would get, to put, get ready to putt, he would holler, be the coyote. Somehow it didn't help. I watched one of the field goal kickers. I don't even remember who was playing yesterday. One of the football games. I like to surf. Amen. Somebody was playing football yesterday and they were talking about a guy. I think he missed two or three field goals. And they said that he was over with the team psychologist. <laughs> That's a new thing now. <laughs> and the team psychologist had pulled him aside. And the lady actually, she said this. She said, I was listening. She said, just like it was interesting to her. She said he was telling him what he needed to do was imagine that the crossbars were wider and he could, he could actually kick through because it was wider. And he went out to the field and we were just all in pins and needles and pfft, he kicked it almost into the stands off to the side. 
I thought, well, you know what? I think of a good way to save a couple hundred thousand dollars. Fire the team psychologist. Amen. Say, hey, idiot, it's only that wide. Kick through it or go sit down. <laughs> Be the coyote. God gave you enough faith to prove that he exists. You say, how do you? Trust him. Trust him. I've challenged people for years who are unsaved. Some of the boisterous and bold unsaved people who are proud of being unsaved. You're going to fall awfully hard when you stand before your maker and find out you didn't have to be like that. You see, you say, well, you can't know that. No, you don't think I can know that because you don't know that. And you must, I mean, you are, you talk about arrogant. Just because you don't know that, you think no one else can know that. The truth of the matter is I know where I'm going when I die. I know that my sins are forgiven. You say, you can't know. You can't know that. Because you haven't taken that measure of faith God gave you and used it. I'm not going to go through my illustration, but my favorite illustration of faith is just climbing up on the chair. Uh, we could put a chair up here that might be kind of weak. Some of the rivets might be popped. Some of the welds might be loose. And we might have you set. You ever sit on a chair and have it kind of give out? Well, you say, well, I, I believe that chair can support my weight. You know, you can bring in all the data you want about the reinforcement of that chair and how it was built and quality craftsmen and, you know, made in America by union laborers and all that good stuff. And it doesn't mean a thing. Because you can sit down and it, it'll hit the floor. You want me to tell you how you know that chair will support your weight? You put your weight in it. By faith. You put your weight in that chair. And by faith or by exercising your faith, you will then gain knowledge you did not have and could not have without faith. Faith is scientific. The very basis of scientific thought begins with taking a theorem or a hypothesis and then testing the hypothesis. You know what a hypothesis is? It's I believe. Not I know, I believe. I believe is a statement of faith. All good science is by faith. And the results come by testing my faith. And I test my faith by utilizing my faith. You want to know whether there's a God? You want to know whether you can get saved? Trust him. See. I mean, you'd hate to get to heaven and find out, well, I, I didn't think. I, did, I just, you know, I thought that was, you want to know whether there's a God or not? Trust him. I'd come and I'd kneel at an altar. I'd say, okay, God, here I am. I'm not sure about what this is, but this preacher says you can save me and that I can know there's a God. Hit me with your best shot. I remember the young man by the name of Mohammed came years ago, sat right back over here, and we talked after the service. And you may not understand, but I have really not been kindly disposed to the Islamic belief system for quite some time. And he sat, and, and I don't think I said anything. Well, I don't remember saying anything that would. <laughs> but someone said after the service, there's a fellow who wants to talk to you. He's in your office. And so I went into my office and we began a discussion. It wasn't a lengthy discussion, but he said, I've been at the university. And he said, your people come to the university. I was never more proud of you, by the way, than at that moment because he knew where to come. They know who you are. He said, they come out there and they pass out pieces of paper. And he said, they, they try to tell us, you know. And he said, I listen to your people. He said, I will always laugh at your people because he said, it makes no sense to me. It's just foolishness. He said, but something they said bothered me. He said that they said that they talked to the Lord or talked to God and that God spoke to them. He says that's an absurdity. By the way, that's how you know they're not the same God. And he said, I found myself more and more frustrated. And he said one evening on my prayer mat as I faced Mecca and prayed, I said this to Allah. If you are indeed the God, speak to me now, and I would gladly die for you. And he said there wasn't a word, because we know Allah doesn't speak. 
He said, I got to my feet, rolled up my mat. And as I was walking away, a little discouraged, even though I knew that he wouldn't speak, something inside me said, why don't you ask the other guy? And he said, I didn't even know how to pray. But he said, I looked to heaven and said, you, the God of these strange people, if you're the true God, speak to me now and I'll serve you. And that moment in that office right back there, tears begin to roll down that young man's face. And he said, he spoke to me in a way that I could not deny. And he said, I'm a Christian. I've put my faith and trust. You know what he did? He took that little measure of faith and he used it. You say, oh, well, you know, figment of it. Tell him that, would you? Go in there, Mr. Smart Guy, Miss Smart Lady, and tell him, well, you know, you just, it was an emotional thing, and you've had a little trauma here, and you'll get, tell him that, would you? Because he knows something you don't know. Because he used the faith God gave him to gain a certainty about his eternal destiny. Boy, aren't you glad you put your faith in Jesus Christ? You imagine you could be bouncing around like a, a steel ball in a pinball machine tonight, just bing, 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 going nowhere. Aren't you glad for the day that all the turmoil of your life, all the hypocrisy, all the sinfulness without any fulfillment, aren't you glad for the day when all the lions just came to a stop and you said, Lord, help me? And he said, I thought you'd never ask. And he came in and he fixed it and he put there in that heart that certainty that everything's all right now. Do you understand that's a basis of faith? Everybody has that much. Everybody that was ever born. You understand people in hell tonight had that much faith? Listen to the scripture again. He hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Everybody has it. Not everybody uses it. And for that reason tonight, the scripture indicates that hell has enlarged itself. Because it contains more than it was ever meant to hold. By the way, it was only meant to hold the devil and his angels. It was never meant to hold a human. That was not God's intent. Man brought upon himself the consequences of his sin. And so hell has enlarged itself. And everybody there, they're there because they didn't use that measure of faith. You know, you can sit in a church... Brother John said it tonight, it's possible to sit in a church and everybody thinks and assumes and you can assume and it's not real, it's not genuine. We need to understand that there is that measure of faith. That faith that is a basis on which we can add, that faith that is small, that can increase, that can grow, that faith that can be tried or tested or stretched and can increase there. And if it is so wonderful that just the smallest amount can bring me to the knowledge of my eternal destiny, how much greater would it be to have great faith? How much more wonderful would it be to have a faith that never swerved, that never wavered, that was exemplary? The faith of some of those martyrs found in the pages of Fox's Book of Martyrs. Who when placed in the place of their demise, ready to be burned at the stake, spent their last few moments of consciousness praising God and asking him to save those who had brought them to that place and put them to death. I believe it was Tyndale, they said, the ropes they had secured his hands with burnt off. And they said that he raised his hands like ten glowing candles and prayed for God to open the King of England's eyes and left this world. Ah, oh, boy, you know what? I don't think I've got that faith. I think I would have to be dragged screaming and kicking. They would have to tie me numerous times and chain me. I would, I'm not, I'm not a martyr. But may I say, I think one of the characteristics of martyrdom is great faith. 
great faith. How do I get that increase in my faith? I want to give you tonight just very quickly. I want you to write them down. I want to read some verses. We're going to go home. But there are some things that we would not expect that have a tendency to increase our faith, to help our faith, to deepen our faith. Sometimes when these things come into our life, we would say, oh, great. I don't need this in my life. But in reality, God, in His mercy and His grace, has brought this into your life to strengthen your faith. You look back over the course of your life, and if you can honestly say tonight, you know, my faith is stronger now than it was when I was years ago or when whatever it was. My faith has grown. I am stronger now. You will look back, and I assure you that in looking back, you will see some trouble, trials, things you did not want, nor did you expect would have the effect they had on your faith. The songwriter says, through many dangers, toils, and snares, we have already come. Tis grace that brought us safe thus far. Listen, we begin to learn that God's grace and God's mercy and that faith that he's given us can sustain us even in difficult times because we have been through some of those difficult times. Are you ready? Hebrews chapter 11 Verse number one, one of the things that strengthen our faith or strengthens our faith is the process of delay. Did you ever ask God to do something right now? Did you ever mandate that God, this has got to be done within 24 hours? I, I, Lord, I, I don't have any more time. I mean, you've got to answer within 24. I got to know. I have to know. Lord, you've got to. And he doesn't do anything. And you say, well, who does he think? He doesn't even have a watch. God, you should be on my time. Eastern Standard. Don't worry about the people in Hawaii. Get on my time. I need you to deal right now on my time schedule, my time frame. I work from 8 to 5. Don't ask me to stay over till 6. I need an answer. We're very demanding of God. And sometimes you say, well, I've got faith. Faith, someone said, is not just believing that he can, but believing that he will. Well, I, I believe that's true, but I don't know that we're always there. I have asked God for some things that I believe that not only could he, but that he would. And then I've asked him for some things that I thought he could, but I wasn't sure whether he would. And then I've been a couple of times I'm asking for things I wasn't sure he could. You say, oh, that's horrible. Uh, there's some things God's holy, and His holiness won't allow Him to do it. So I must confess that I think that all three of those things may be true. But Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Do you know just because you can't see something doesn't mean it doesn't exist? <laughs> it's a, I hate to pick on scientists, and, and there's nothing wrong with scientific inquiry. I appreciate it. But the very idea that you would criticize me for having faith, and yet you believe everything's constructed of something you can't even see and couldn't see till somebody invented a microscope. Well, we made this discovery. Why did you make a microscope in the first place if you didn't suspect there was something smaller than what you could see? So faith led you to that discovery, huh? You didn't know, and now you do. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. In other words, it's the reality of things that aren't real. And the evidence of things not seen. You ever said to God, I didn't know you were doing that in my life, but I appreciate it now. I thank you for what you... It's the evidence of things at the time you didn't suspect. And now you look back and there's the evidence and God says, listen, you thought I didn't love you and I loved you more at that moment than I ever loved you before. You thought I didn't care and I cared more for you at that moment than I ever cared. Faith is that substance. It is sometimes delays. I think of Hannah back there as she went to pray and asked the Lord for a man child. Remember that story? How Hannah went and prayed and the Bible said that she did so year by year. How many times do you believe Miss Hannah went home and said, well, 
nothing. I asked God. I was hoping it'd be today. I was hoping it'd be this year, but it was delays. And so she went back again and again and again and again with the same request. And finally, God gave her her request. You say, well, boy, that just doesn't seem. Do you know what her delay did? It deepened her faith in God. You say, why? Because she was like most of us. She probably tried everything in the world there was to enhance, to make it happen, and this is going to work, and I got this new product, and I got this this thing over here, and they say if you do this, you know, and all. And you know what? She finally tried every bit of that and said, you know what? It doesn't work. If God doesn't do this, it's not going to happen. Deeper faith than when she started, and God blessed. Sometimes those delays in your life are tailor-made by your creator in heaven. You say, well, but I need him now. You don't know what's going on. (laughs) I need him now. I need him to work this out now. I need him, boy, I need him to do this now. You have no idea what tomorrow holds. How could you possibly know what you need now? I've had people tell me, boy, preacher, if I had a million dollars in gold and nothing would bother me. Yeah, it would. How would you move it? You know, I just had a million dollars. If you had a million dollars in gold, there'd be 35 people camped outside your house tonight. You'd stay awake all night long because you had a million dollars in gold. You wouldn't be able to sleep. If you had a million dollars in gold, you'd panic every time the phone rang for fear it'd be the IRS. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of downsides to having a million dollars in gold. Sometimes God puts those delays in your life because you know what it does? It strengthens strengthens. Did you ever tell God how to give you what you want? I'm real good at that. I can, man, I can plan. I have given God some guaranteed no fire, no, no failure situation. I said, Lord, if you do this and this and this, look at how that work out, God. Did you ever negotiate with your Savior? I do. I think he looks at me like a three-year-old. He goes, that's good. Now try to stay in the lines while you color. I have infant faith. I've tried to figure it out. I've tried to tell God. I've tried to explain to him my plan that's surefire guaranteed to work, and he doesn't do anything about it. And then after some period of time, something happens, and I say, oh, yeah, I, 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 guess, I guess it wouldn't have worked. Thank you, God, for not taking my advice. My strength or my faith is stronger because of the delays. Let me say this. Sometimes it is not only the delays, sometimes it is the doubts that come into the course of our mind. Matthew, excuse me, Mark chapter 9. I won't read all of the passage, but the man brings his son to the Lord and he says, my son has a dumb spirit. Now that's the spirit that kept his son from communicating. He couldn't speak. We call that deaf and dumb. That has nothing to do with an intellect. He just did not have the capacity to speak. And the Lord began to ask him about this situation. And he said, I took them to your disciples and they couldn't help me. They they gave me no help. And and now I'm coming to you. And the Lord in verse 21 of Mark 9 asks the father, how long is it ago since this came? And he said, it's as a child. And from what we read here is probably a a grown or at least an older young man. You understand what it was like to have those doubts. These people came and they couldn't do anything. I prayed and nothing happened. Do you understand that sometimes it is God's delay, but sometimes in the course of those delays, that other idea of doubt creeps in. Did you ever doubt God? If you haven't ever doubted him, you haven't been around very long, that time will come, trust me. You say, why would he do that? Why would he let me doubt? Because it makes you stronger. Because at some point you realize, you know, when I didn't think he could, when I didn't think he would, he was doing everything just the way it needed to be done. He brought it to pass. I I won't bore you tonight with the story of my coming to Toledo, but this was not my choice. This was not my place. I had a place. When I left Bible school, they, they thought this is where he's going. They announced it. Everybody knew that my wife and I were leaving Bible college and we were going to this place. God had called us. And we didn't get there. We got to Toledo. You know, we tried and we worked and seemed like one obstacle came up after another. And the truth of the matter is that there were times where I just doubted what God was going to do or if he was going to do anything at all. 
You know what he was doing through those doubts? He was building faith. I'll be honest with you, the only reason I ever came to this place was faith. I would have to say with that other destination, there was some kind of a, a draw to it. Who wouldn't want to live there? Who wouldn't want to be there? I mean, even if you went there and failed, think of where you'd be. So there was a mystique about that, and God pulled all that away in the course of dealing with us. And so when somebody said, hey, would you come to Toledo? It was, you know what, I'd go anywhere just to have him use us. And all at once, you know what he did through those times of doubt? He was working. There are times not only of doubt, but there are times of distress. Times of distress. The Bible tells us in Mark chapter 5, verse 25, about a woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years. She's the woman that came and touched the hem of his garment. She said, if I can but touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made whole. Can I tell you how she came to that conclusion? She came to that conclusion because she had been in distress. After that length of time, you know what the Bible tells us? It said she had seen all of the doctors and spent all that she had and was made no better. Do you ever suppose she prayed and asked God to heal her? Sure she did. Do you ever suppose as she was praying, somebody showed up and was well-intentioned and said, well, you know, you need to see my doctor. He just, man, you talk, he's really good. And she went to one doctor, and then she went to another doctor, and then she went to another doctor, and then she went to a... Do you understand how distress can weaken your faith? And finally, she got out the phone book and turned in the yellow pages, and there were no more physicians. She had seen them all. And she looked over into the coffer and there was no more money anyway if there had been another doctor. Do you know what brought her to Jesus Christ? Her distress. I like what Peter said when Jesus in John chapter 6 says to the disciples, will ye also go away? Listen, Peter got it wrong more than he got it right. But he got it right that day. He said, Lord, where shall we go? Thou hast the words of life. Here is a lady in her distress. She said, I know I have nowhere else to go, but I believe I, if I touch the hem of his garment. Her distress increased her faith. Let me move quickly. Her danger, the dangers sometimes. I don't like dangers. I don't like being afraid. I really do not like fear at all. And yet it is so easy to come by. Fear is a common reaction to things that are misunderstood in our lives. Uh, the things that you feared, as a rule, haven't happened. I think I told you the other day, I had read somewhere that, oh, I think it was above 90%, I'm not sure exactly what the ratio was, above 90% of the things we worry about never happen. And yet they consume us, our fears. You say, well, why does that have to happen? Sometimes our fears will drive us to the Lord, and he will do what needs to be done. It increases our faith. I've seen people, I listen, when you've done this as long as I have, you've seen people come and you've seen people go. I've seen people come to church and dwell for a season, and then they're out and they're gone. And uh, Sometimes they come back, and you just never really know. I, I'll be honest with you, you have no idea whether I'm going to be here tomorrow. I have no idea whether you're going to be here tomorrow. But if that were to happen, if there was that place where we left this place, we would confront fears. And when those fears came, when those problems came, you know what the thought always is? I wonder if this would have happened if I'd been true to the Lord. I wonder what would have happened if I'd have stayed in church. I wonder what would have happened if I'd have kept reading my Bible. And when that fear comes, you know what it does? It pulls and it stretches and it's tried. And all at once, we realize, you know what? The best thing I can do just be to trust him again like I did one time before. But now to a greater capacity because my faith has been strengthened through my dangers. Listen, David said, yea, though I walk through the, va the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. You understand the fear in that? You understand the faith? I walk through. I walk through. 
I walk through, I'll fear no evil. You say, boy, how did he get there? Oh, God must have given him just great. Listen, God just didn't dump faith on him. That guy knew what it was to be in danger for his life again and again and again and again and again. Every time he found himself in a place where Saul was about to kill him, every time he found himself hiding in the caves of Adullam, every time he found himself just running for fear of his life, God was strengthening him. And one day he sat down and he wrote those words we just read. And you know what he said? I can walk through the valley of the shadow of death now and not be afraid. You say, why? Because he's delivered me so many times before. I'm not afraid anymore. There are dangers and those dangers increase our faith. And then let me say this, death. Death. Death will increase your faith. Now, I'll be honest with you, I'm not going to ask for the Lord to increase my faith this way. This is not on my list of things to ask God for. Uh, I'd like to live. You say, how long? As long as possible. Okay? Okay. Uh, I, I'm not anxious to die. I'm not ready to get on the next bus. I'm, I'm ready for heaven, anxious to get to heaven. But I want to be caught out. Amen. Uh, I don't want to leave a hospital bed. And sometimes you begin to think about dying, and sometimes the Lord brings you down to that valley of that shadow of death, and you walk down into that valley. And very often, you know, you come right back up the other side. It really wasn't reality, but for a moment it was real in your life. You say, well, you know, you're not really dying. I got news for you. It's not the dying, it's the thinking you're going to die that's really hard to deal with. But every time the Lord puts you in those circumstances and brings you through in a miraculous measure, you know what it does for you? It gives you great faith. I sometimes sit and talk with some of the old saints that have served the Lord and loved the Lord and lived for the Lord. And it's interesting in their conversation to hear them say, you know, I'm just ready to go home. You know, he didn't say that as a young man. You can bring one of these teenagers up here tonight where you can talk to them about their life. And, and I'll be honest with you, if they just got up here in front of the microphone tonight at 15 and said, well, you know, I'm just, I'm just ready to go home. Wouldn't that sound kind of disingenuous? Huh? Sure it would. But you know, when you've served the Lord and loved the Lord and lived for the Lord and now those gray hairs have come and you can see just over the hillside there. When someone like that says, you know what, I've been down that valley a lot, and it's not nearly as fearful as I thought, and I'm just kind of ready to go home. You say, what is that? Is that foolishness? No, that's faith. That's faith that's grown. That's faith that says, you know, I trusted him way back here when I was 15, and he led me. And he took me through some of these doubts and some of these distresses and some of these dangers in my life. He took me through these things. And, you know, now that I have followed him all the way through, I'm not really worried about the dying part. I'll walk through the valley, and if I don't come out on the other side, I'll go yonder to be with him. But even those times you've confronted and came close to death have made you deeper in your faith. You understand that sometimes, and the whole course of what I want to say to you tonight is the things that we recoil from the most very often are the things God wants to use in your life. The things you get angry at God about very often are what he designed just for you to deepen, to strengthen, to increase your faith. Why? Because this is the victory that overcomes the world even our faith. If you have great faith, there'll be great victory. If you have little faith, there'll be little or no victory. And so God brings those things to bear and stretches us and pulls us. And those times when you say, God, I can't bear anymore. I'm scared. I'm tired. I'm weary. I don't know which way to go. Understand, let God have his way and his work in your life. And you'll come through saying, you know what? God took care of me. And in all those places, I've learned to trust him more. The songwriter said, tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word. Just to rest upon his promise. 
You know what that was? That was not someone who just started yesterday. That was someone who had learned by the experiences of life. When God brings you into those places in this week, in the coming days, in those places in your life, learn to recognize them for what they are. And when you see them coming, thank the Lord for them. You say, why? Because if you wait till they get there, it's very hard to thank the Lord for them. But when you see them coming before they get to you, it would be a good rule of thumb to say, God, here it comes. And I'm really thankful, Lord, that you've chosen me to be in these because I know, Lord, it'll make me a better Christian. It'll help me trust you more. God, if I say something foolish when they get here, forgive me. If I do something foolish, have mercy. But, Lord, I just want you to know right now because I can't probably tell you this in a few days, weeks, or months. But I want you to know I'm thanking you now for what's ahead that's going to increase my faith. The trying of your faith worketh patience. Growing faith makes you stronger. Let's bow our heads tonight. We get angry. We run. We get upset. We panic. All of those are normal reactions to some of the things that we deal with in life. Sometimes we say, God, what are you doing? As though he doesn't know what he's doing. Sometimes we are tempted to say, God, do you even care about me when we know that he cares deeply? But sometimes it's those circumstances that are in our life and we say, God, what are you doing to me? Let me tell you what he's doing. He's growing your faith. He's growing your faith so you'll be stronger than you were. He's helping you for what's yet down the road, that bigger task, that bigger obstacle that you're going to confront and get the victory over because he's tested you and proven you and increased your faith. Do you realize that maybe what you're going to have to deal with 10 years from tonight you would never be able to deal with unless God begins to train you tonight in some of those small things? And so the next time you're tempted to just say, God, what's going on? Learn to rest in this fact that he wants your faith to increase, to deepen, to lengthen, to broaden. He wants that faith to be able to say, hey, you know what? I'm willing to go down in the valley of the shadow of death. It really doesn't mean anything because he's with me. I've learned that. Let him do his work. Let him make you the person that he wants you to be. I want the pianist to play tonight. The song is Trust and Obey. I don't think we're going to sing. I think we're just going to play for a minute. And the song talks about how wonderful it is to just trust and obey. That's faith. That's faith. That's with Job saying, he knows the way I take. And when I'm tried, I'll come forth as gold. That's going through that adversity and allowing that very often that our adversities frame our character. And if you doubt that, look back at what God's already brought you through and see what miraculous things he's done. Some of you wouldn't read the Bible. You wouldn't study the Bible. Some of you wouldn't be in church as faithful as you are had it not been for some of the things God's allowed to come into your life that's deep in your faith, strengthened some of your worst moments it turns out were some of your best moments because you trusted him and he brought you through while she plays this through if you need to come tonight join these that are here why don't you do that right now you say we're going to sing no we're not going to sing just give you a chance to come trust him trust him trust him he's working he's working He's working in your life. He's the potter. He's shaping the clay. And it'll bring glory to him somewhere. Trust him. He knows what he's doing.
piano continue to play just for a moment. We're not going to. You can still come if you'd like. Just want to remind you we're going to be taking up this offering. And this offering is for the Aiken Bible. It's nothing to do with church. Every dime that will go into these pans will go to Brother Harding and the printing of these scriptures. You say, what do you think it will do any good? Couldn't hurt. Couldn't hurt. I mean, if a Bible goes into a congressman or a senator's office and sits there for 10 years and does nothing but draw dust, and then at some moment, for no unexplained for no explained reason, he pulls it off the shelf and reads it. It has done its work. Let's get the job done. So tonight, as we take this offering there at the back door, keep in mind what it's about. Do what you would, and uh, we'll see that it gets to him. Let's be dismissed tonight very quietly, and leave these that are here praying all the time that they need, and uh, thank God that He's worked in our lives. I remember the old song, the old gospel song that the gospel quartet used to sing that said, thank you for the valley I walk through today. The darker the valley, the more I learn to pray. Sometimes your difficulties, your darknesses, your distresses make you a better person of faith.